In today's world, people feel lost in a sea of ideas. Which ones should we accept? Stay tuned because you're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Here is your host, Kurt Jarris. Well, a good day to you, and thanks for joining us here for another episode of Veracity Hill, where we are striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. It's the countdown to episode 200. We are at 192 and uh, very excited to continue our march along. We've got a, um, a fascinating subject to talk about on today's program. Uh, we are uh, not talking about politics. We are talking about the faith and society aspects of our tagline. And um, there have been a number of episodes throughout the years where we've talked about maybe a film. I think we've done Star Wars. We've done uh, Avengers. Yeah. Um, what other... What other movies have we touched on over the years not, well not many more i think we've done star wars a couple times as they've released right right and then uh, avengers movies as they released especially the end game which was a recent episode yeah that's right um and so well while we've talked specifically about those movies on today's program we're going to be talking more about themes motifs the importance of Mark opening his can of something. Mark's... I knew I forgot, I knew I forgot <laughs> something to do before we started. And I just opened my uh, sparkling water. No worries. I, so I hope to... Uh, Mark, I know you have a couple questions for our guests today. And um, we've got some interesting questions to be asking about uh, art and film and, and uh, what we can learn from American movies. Uh, what does it mean to have a Christian perspective uh, on uh, that subject? So our guest today uh, is... William Romanowski, he's the author of Cinematic Faith, A Christian Perspective uh, on Movies and Meaning. He is, uh, interestingly enough, he's the Arthur H. DeCroyder Chair in Communication at Calvin College and speaks frequently on subjects dealing with American culture uh, and the entertainment industry. I, I say interestingly enough because Arthur H. DeCroyder is the founding pastor of Christ Church of Oak Brook in Oak Brook, Illinois. That's the church that I grew up at and spent my childhood at, uh, 20, uh, just short or just, just over 20 plus years. It depends if you include my college years. Uh, well, I, I don't go there now because of distance, but I mean, Arthur de Croyd, I listened to his sermons when I was a child and, uh, uh, Bill, uh, you hold the chair in his honor. So it's sort of great that we have that connection. Uh, and thank you for joining us on our program today. No, that, that is a very cool connection, and and thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah. So so tell me, um, before we jump into uh, the material of the book, let me ask you, what got you interested uh, in film and analyzing and studying uh, this art? Well, um, we only have an hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's actually started when. Um, uh, I was working after my undergraduate years, I, I worked for the campus ministry. And one of the things that we discovered was that college students went to the movies to watch television, listen to popular music, and that was a way to engage them. And so I became interested in it then. Uh, uh, actually, at first at first, more interested in music than mm. I was in uh, uh, in uh, the, the cinema. But then along the way, um, you know, my my interest gravitated from uh, from popular music to uh, uh, muse films that had rock soundtracks in them. So then I started studying both the film and the recording industries. And then when I came to Calvin College, I filled in a need uh, to uh, teach courses in film studies and, and um, have really enjoyed it very much. Yeah, very nice. That's great. Um, and and perhaps. You know, there are many people that dream of kind of having a job like yourself where you get to watch movies and write about it and teach it. <laughs> so that... yeah, we, my motto is you spend a lot of time in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah. I always remember when I was a, a, a teenager and I would go to movies frequently um, at the theater or at the cinema. Um, it was the weirdest thing when you would show up at the daytime and you would leave and it would be night like you, you missed dusk. And so there's just this quick jump. That was always a weird experience for me. <laughs> well, and it, yeah, I mean, when you go to the movie, it's like going to a different world, you know. Mm. And so in a certain sense, when you walk out like that, it really is a surprising kind of a change, you know, to walk back into reality that way. Yeah. Yes, good. And we're going to be touching upon that, that concept of uh, creating a real, uh, sort of a reality. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a fun thing that, 
humans can be creative and in the same sense create uh, as the creator, uh, the creator God has. Uh, so we share that uh, quality or ability, I should say, um, with with God that we can create these worlds ourselves. Now, n- not physically. I mean, virtual reality is trying to take that to the next level. Um, so that's that's a fascinating. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if I should say improvement because um, some people become dependent on it, though. So there's, I guess, with anything, there's pros and cons. Yeah. Um, okay. So, oh, go ahead, Bill. No, I was going to say when you look at the history of the cinema, uh, you know, they start with short silent films, then they develop into feature length silent films, then they add sound to it. Then they go into widescreen processes, 3D and this sort of thing. So yeah. the movement has always been toward greater realism mm. in of that, you know. So now the chairs move and all those kinds of things like that. And, and uh, so what you're describing in terms of virtual reality, someday that may well be the case that the person sitting next to you in the theater is actually in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Wow. I realized um, I just touched my beard and that's something I I wanted to mention at the start was um, we are at an interesting point in American society right now with the um, uh, the coronavirus COVID-19. Is it called COVID? COVID-19. COVID COVID And so, um, um, yes, I want to encourage listeners not to touch your face. I'll try not to do it myself. But when I'm thinking, that's such, just a, a, such a habit of mine, stroking my beard. I'm going to try not to do that. And of course, I want to, want to remind uh, you guys to wash your hands, keep some distance from people, that sort of thing. Uh, don't freak out, even though the grocery stores are emptying with food. <laughs> but the, the supply will catch up. So it, it's okay. But I did want to mention that. All right. Now, Bill, let me ask you this. So um, why is there a need for a, a Christian approach to uh, analyzing film? Yeah, well, uh, as I started to say earlier, it's, it, it is one of the ways that we, we navigate the complexities of life. Um, and that's, that's true of all the arts, okay? But in particular with the cinema, uh, which has always been considered the democratic art because people can afford to go to it regardless of their their income and all. Um, And they are, because it's a highly commercialized art form, movies tend, at least in terms of like uh, mainstream Hollywood films, if we we talk about American movies here, they tend to be uh, reflective of contemporary uh, mythology, perspectives, issues, uh, and at the same time, be grounded historically in traditional genres and and, and ways of thinking. Mm. And so it's a very fertile ground in a certain sense to try to understand the preoccupations of a people. And so for Christians, uh, you know, my argument in the book is that uh, a lot of Christians, uh, regardless of the, and, and that's using the word Christian today is there's a broad swath of different kinds of <laughs> yeah, Christians what, what out the there. Yeah, term that, means, yeah, that, right. You know. So the book is really aimed to make people, to heighten their awareness of, uh, of their own perspective, and then at the same time, make them aware of the, the uh, dominant perspectives in, in mainstream American culture and in mainstream uh, uh, American films, mm. uh, so that uh, you're able to think critically then about the about them, uh, uh, and and at the same time, heighten your appreciation for it. You know, so it's like I I think I make crack in the book that it's not like every film has to uh, have the Heidelberg Catechism in it or something yeah, like right. sort like that. But it's just sort of the idea then that uh, a lot of times Christians like movies that can be antithetical to uh, their own general view about life, mm. but they're they're unaware of how to think critically about films. And so they, they, they don't always put two and two together on, on, on that. Yes, and and an outworking of that is sometimes, or I mean, there has been an attempt by Christians to create overtly Christian art, uh, which preaches to people, basically. And, and, and that doesn't make good art. So people have seen how from their perspective, movies 
have uh, communicated a view that's antithetical to their position, like you said, and they thought, hey, well, let's make movies for Christians. And whether it's Christians trying to do it or uh, Hollywood trying to do it for Christians, there haven't been, I mean, there have been some successes, but generally there have been some movies which have not been good on sort of an objective measure. Would you share that same analysis? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. It gets at and I, the key concept in the book is this this idea of having a um, framework of expectations. Mm. I'm sure you remember that from the opening chapters and stuff like that. And and I I latched on to that concept because um, concepts like uh, Christian worldview, for instance, you know, can be seem pretty static. As if as though people have a set of beliefs, they know what they are, they know how to use them. That's the grid through which they they view everything. Okay, I don't think that's how people watch movies, nor do I think that's how people live. Yeah. And so the idea of a framework of expectations is that people have assumptions or ideals and attitudes about the cinema in general, what it should do, how it should function in our lives. And then they have particular things that they expect in movies. Mm. And so a lot of the, the films that you're describing, one of the expectations is that movies would would function uh, to, to do evangelism. Okay. And so then in their minds, if, to do evangelism means... You don't have to be concerned so much about character depth or <laughs> narrative Script development. Script writing, or, cinematography. To, <laughs> exactly. You can go down the gamut, right? None <laughs> of those things sort of matter, okay? Uh, what's important is that there's a, a clear presentation of the gospel in the in the film. Yeah. And so uh, that's that's the way that they approach that. Um, and, so, and, and the interesting thing is this. Most people go to movies— to be affirmed in what they already believe. Mm. And it, it's it's pretty rare when a film actually changes the way you believe. Now, I do think movies can uh, make you aware of what you believe, especially in a different sort of circumstance, you know? So like, um, uh, if, if you never encountered a person with a disability, and then you, you see a movie about someone with a disability, it might raise your awareness of what you think about people who have a disability, mm. you know, the same thing can happen in with any, any sort of experience in life. If you, if you never lost through death, someone that you love, that's close to you. Um, and then you see it and see that in the movie, it might raise your awareness of how you would think about those sorts of things had, had they occurred. So cinema can really function in that way. Um, and, but it, but it, uh, this expect great, framework of expectations idea is such that that you can have attitudes about the cinema but you could also have when you go in there if you go to watch a romantic comedy you expect to see boy meets girl boy loses girl boy gets girl and if boy doesn't get girl at the end people are upset like in la la land you know people were all upset about the end of the movie <laughs> yeah, yeah, these guys are reacting yeah. here exactly yeah, yeah. and the, was, and the uh, filmmakers said they gave us both endings and you could pretty much choose the one that you wanted, you know? Um, and the same thing with, if you go see an action film, you expect the bad guy to get blowed up in the end, you know, that, that as well. So, so you could have expectations about a variety of expectations and they can change and vary. So mm. they, they, uh, there's, uh, I use the phrase, there's a hanging togetherness of, mm. of, of those sorts of things when, when we, we go to movies. Yeah. And, uh, as you've mentioned before, there are these traditional genres. And um, so like I, I think of action films, um, yeah, you want the bad guy to lose in the end. And I, I think that's – for many um, Marvel uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe fans, the hardcore fans sort of knew what Infinity War would bring about. Um, that in, at least for that standalone film, the bad guy would win. Um but even then with Endgame, I mean, there's still sort of that expectation, but there's the curiosity about how's it going to be done? How's it going to be accomplished? Uh, and then, um, and again, you know, you haven't seen every film, but perhaps you've seen uh, th those. Um, I, I think the plot twist, so many fans weren't expecting, uh, you know, the first 15 minutes of Endgame uh, where Thor goes and, you know, 
cuts off his head. It's 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 far past the spoiler yeah, uh, yeah, time, yeah, yeah. right? I mean, this is yes. Okay, this reminds me too. Yeah. Well, so Bill, I mean, this is something you mentioned in your introduction, like massive spoiler alerts. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> because right. yeah, it's a it's a hard time talking about film if you're not talking about critical plot points or you know a resolution. Um, so, okay, so with Endgame, right, so that was a big plot twist because all of a sudden the big baddie was killed 15 minutes into the film or something like that. And so you're just like, well, wait, what do they do now? Um, so that, that was sort of a creative way of um, upending the genre. You know, you watch the movie and then the, ba- the baddie ends, uh, loses in the end. Um, so, of course, that happens twice. That still happens. Um in, in with the whole time travel and all that. but So that's sort of a creative take on the genre uh, uh, with the plot twist. So there are still ways, and also like a, a rom-com, I think of the breakup with Vince Vaughn and Jennifer Aniston, where you want them to end up together, you know, and they, they don't in the end. I know that's an older film now. You need to see better movies. Yeah, I guess I do. Um, you need to see better movies. All right. <laughs> So for for longtime listeners, uh, they might know Mark is the big film buff, and Chris, of course, has his own. Um, you've got your list of a hundred top one hundred, mm-hmm. constantly changing, yeah. that, that sort of thing. He's updating. Mm-hmm. So these guys are definitely more film buffs than I am. But I like talking about these concepts and these principles uh, because it's important for Christians to be equipped uh, to analyze art in an objective way. This is what cultural apologetics is about. It's not about evangelizing and preaching to people, but making good art. You know, writing Chronicles of Narnia, Lord of the Rings, and carrying these themes and motifs to communicate to people these Christian virtues, but not in an overtly Christian in-your-face way. And so movies, the cinema, can do that as well. And so that's why it's important that we think about and talk about uh, these themes. Um, Okay, so... uh, Bill, I want to talk to you about the, the – we touched on it a little bit, the creating of reality, um, uh, creating an illusion of reality as you call it. Maybe you could talk more uh, about that. Yeah, well, all, yeah, that's that's a good question. An interesting thing because you're, you're, you're interested in this angle on it, so I'll go into it, is that when you make uh, – when you paint a painting, um, there's distance between – uh, the subject and the and the artwork, if if you will, you know, uh, when you when you make a movie, you're actually filming reality, and so it makes it look more real mm. to, to people. Okay, the key thing is is that in a movie, it, 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 generally speaking, everything that's in there is in there by somebody making a decision, and so the thing I'm always I try to impress upon my students is that. Fiction films are always a construction of reality. They are always an artistic vision of reality. They always have are, uh, imbue a perspective on the events and the characters and, and uh, situations that they find themselves in. And so um, uh, the key then to, the, to watch movies is to understand how, how filmmakers convey all of that to us. Mm. And so, uh, in the you know, in the book, I stress this, and I do in my introduction to film and media class as well, is that uh, you talk about film form, which is the cinematic techniques, and you gave a list of those things earlier: cinematography, editing, sound, you know, those things. And then, what's the relationship between the form and the content? And then you can talk about film style that you use to communicate those things, and then that gets you into talking about perspective in in, in terms of the film as well. So the key thing is under, really getting at how do they convey all that stuff? How do they create this world that we has the appearance of reality? Verisimilitude is the big fancy word for it, you know, that they create this world that's very believable, that we want to become a part of. We want to cross, cross over the thresholds through the screen into that world and experience those things with the characters. How do they do that so effectively? You know, that gauges our imagination and our emotions and cognitive thinking and those sorts of things. Yes, uh, the term verisimilitude. Believe it or not, you're not the first one on the program to use that term. Uh, we had a new test. Oh, I'll bet Chris uses that two, three times. A day. <laughs> yeah, 
we we had a guest, uh, Craig Evans, a New Testament scholar at Houston Baptist University. He used that term to describe the Gospels. The Gospels uh, have verisimilitude, uh, so they they look like they're telling the truth, and and that's a, an aspect to from his field their trustworthiness. Uh, yeah. Of course, in your context, it would it would mean that this is good art. Um, yeah. And so when you can tell when the script writing uh, and the acting aren't good, it doesn't reflect reality. People don't speak that way normally. And so that wouldn't have verisimilitude, and that's what makes it poor art. Yeah, that's absolutely right. You you know, when you think about characters, for instance, and I'll, I'll give you a two-part kind of response to that is, typically in, in American films, uh, the main characters are basically good, contrary to the Christian tradition of people being basically sinful. The main characters are basically good. They might be temporarily wayward, but then they're going to get on track, and in the end, good's going to triumph over evil and th- those sorts of things like that. You know, That's why I'm always amazed. A lot of times, that's a fundamental difference in the way Christians profess to believe and the way they, what they value in terms of motion pictures, for instance, in mm. that, you know. The other thing about verisimilitude is that when you watch a film, what the movie's about and, and the perspective it brings to bear on that subject also has to do with verisimilitude. Is that, is that believable? Is, would people really believe that and think that way and act that way? You know, th- those kinds of things. And to go back to your earlier question, a lot of times, films that are made simply to evangelize come across as lacking in verisimilitude mm. that indeed that's not the way people talk that's not the way they act and and situations really don't evolve the, the way that they do you know in that sense so yeah chris is uh, certainly nodding i mean he is in full agreement here <laughs> yeah yeah there's um there's a, a movie reviewer i've come to love over on youtube who's uh is call this uh what's his name say goodnight kevin is the name of his channel and he Hmm. only reviews christian movies (laughs) Uh, his mission is to hold uh, the christian Hmm. cinematic world to the same standard that we hold other movies good and the biggest sin that he often describes when he finishes reviewing a film is that it places message over story Hmm. uh so he says that's probably Hmm. the biggest sin of most christian quote-unquote films nowadays is they're so in a rush to proclaim a message that they don't bother to tell a story that's believable. Mm. Yeah. Well, the best, you know, I my point in the book, too, is that the best films don't tell, you know, they show. They don't say, they display. And uh, and indeed, that's, that's the way it works. So, yeah. Great. Hey, Mark, uh, you had a couple questions that you wanted to ask Bill. Uh, Which you pretty much took. Um, well, I mean... Well, no, pretty much, no, you pretty much, yeah, no, you did. I mean, like, so, I, you should know, Bill, that in the office here, um, I actually am not as big of a hater of certain Christian movies as these two are like. <laughs> I mean, obviously there's a big difference between Christian movies and, you know, Hollywood movies, but... I think that, um, you know, like, movies like, I'm, I'm fine with movies like Facing the Giants or, you know, uh, Courageous or stuff like that, but, I mean, you know, I'm not a fan of, you know, like, God's Not Dead or, oh. or Heaven Forbid, that Nicolas Cage Left Behind movie, <laughs> um, which was one of the worst things mankind has ever done. <laughs> um, it really is truly awful. Um, but... I do agree with you that there are certain movies that can, like, bring up uh, Christian values without having to hit the nail on the head so much. For example, I think you mentioned in the book, and I know this is a a big movie around with Christians, and is a great movie, too, is uh, Groundhog Day with uh, Bill Murray. Um, You know, that definitely has a lot of Christian-y undertones to it. Have you seen that, Kurt? I have. Um, okay, good. I just want to yeah, make sure you're not I'm, left out of the loop on this one. Left out of the loop. The loop. I get it. Oh, I get it. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, that yeah. was not intended, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, so, I just... so my um, 
uh, I've heard Groundhog Day used in there. I am touching my beard again. Um, in in uh, conversations of philosophy of religion um, regarding divine providence. So there's a view of divine providence and and, and foreknowledge, uh, really foreknowledge, called Molinism. Uh, Bill, this is maybe not outside of your field, but um, so Molinism is the idea that before creating the universe, God has uh, knowledge of all possible worlds and all feasible worlds, and they just kind of roll out or, or, or play out. He can choose which one he wants to actualize. And uh, William Lane Craig, when I took his philosophy of religion class, um, he sort of mentioned Groundhog Day as an example of these possible worlds. These are different scenarios that play out. And so I watched Groundhog Day. I hadn't then, but I had watched it. So now it's like 10 years ago. Um, and to see what he meant, that there are these different possible worlds that play out. Um, so that was sort of my reference point for Groundhog Day. And it's a hilarious movie. And then they did the Super Bowl commercial, which I mean, was just great uh, recently. But Bill, you had some thoughts on Groundhog Day yourself in the book. You, you referenced it, did, didn't you? Yeah, I did refer. I made comment because, like every religious tradition, claimed it as their own, you know, <laughs> uh, in one way or another. And it was interesting that Harold Ramis said he he didn't see any religion whatsoever when he he did the picture. He thought it was thoroughly humanistic, in, huh. you know, in, in its concept and all. So, it, but it goes to show you that people can find yeah. uh, meaning in things, whether it's intended by the person, you know, the creator or not. Hey, I got to tell you a story, though. I was in New York City with my daughter, uh, who is a tour director, and she had just finished up a tour there. And so we were there. And so it was uh, it was like a, it was Monday evening. And uh, we went to see the Broadway production of, of Groundhog Day. OK. And so and it, it was fun. It was fun to see. And then we flew home the next day on Tuesday. And that Tuesday night, Bill Murray showed up at that theater to see, for the first time ever to see that production of Groundhog Day. We we missed him by one night. That wow. would have been so much fun. And I, I read the story and saw some stuff on the news, and he was interacting with all the people in the in the uh, audience and things. And then he liked it so much, he, he went back the next night, too, to see it again. So, wow. So I missed it by one night of all the things. Oh, bummer. <laughs> yeah. But it is, it is a classic film. Um, and, yeah, you can – in some ways, find uh, things um, um, sort of that's part of the subjective experience as a human is, is you can look for things which you appreciate in the movie. Um, so, you know, we can think of how his he builds character and virtue over time. Um, yeah. He learns the arts. He learns how to play piano. <laughs> yeah. It's speak French. <laughs> that's you right. Know? Yeah. Yeah. So not just yeah. uh, um, the enjoyment of. Uh, aspects to human life, but that he, he becomes a better person, uh, a, a holier person. There's a process of sanctification for him. Uh, yeah. And in my, my thing, it's, it's, it, it fits in the mold of classical Hollywood films in the sense that it takes him a long time, you know, many, 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 many lifetimes there before he sort of has that moment of self-realization about himself, mm. you know, which then, of course, then he can, uh, you know, uh, Andy McDowell, the film producer that he's he's in love with, he can finally have a meaningful relationship with her. But, but um, and yeah, and in the process, he learns all those things, becomes a much better person, and, it, you know, discovers things about himself at the same time. So, yep. Good. Bill, we've got to take a break here. Uh, when we come back, we'll keep going with our conversation about uh, – uh, film and art and, and what it means to have a Christian perspective uh, and um, how to analyze film well. Uh, that's sort of my interest here is, is helping people do that. And of course, people are still going to have their differences over what they think is good art. Just like I recall um, uh, Jim Spiegel over at Taylor University. Right. He, he says the Beatles are the best, uh, <laughs> produce the best music on planet Earth. And, I mean, I know the Beatles have created good art, but I don't know if it's, like, the best. So there's still always debate over what is the best. But sometimes it's it's easier to see, isn't it, what what is good art, uh, better art versus other art. Uh, so we'll continue our conversation after this short break uh, from our sponsors. You're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Evangelical Christians are talking about hell. 
What if we believe what we believe because we've always believed it? What if the gospel is really a matter of life and death? We want you to open your mind, open your Bible, and rethink hell. At RethinkingHell.com, evangelicals look at what the Bible says about hell, putting conventional and controversial views to the test. Let's say there's this Christian apologist. You love their message, but have trouble finding their videos, their articles, or social media posts. How do you stay connected to them? We're on it. Defenders Media uses the tools of the digital age to create content for your favorite apologists. We give them more screen time, more digital soapboxes, and more presence to deliver more of the content that you love. That's what we do. I know that social media is important to those of you who follow my work. Many respond to my videos and posts on Facebook and Twitter. But it becomes impossible after a while to keep up with it all and to continue with research. That's why I'm thrilled that we have found a solution, Defenders Media. Whether it's a website, whether it's printed material, whether it's a question on graphics, I cannot do what I do and reach my audience without the help of Defenders Media. They have been integral in helping me to reach my audience. Defenders Media ensures consistent content reaches your hand from today's leading apologists and apologetic ministries, like Mike Lycona, Apologetics 315, the Veracity Hill Podcast with Kurt Jarris, and more. To learn more, text the word DEFENDERS to 555-888, and we'll send you a free PDF of the top five ways to share the gospel online. Thanks for sticking with us through that short break from our sponsors. If you'd like to learn how you can become a sponsor, you can go to our website, click on the Sponsor tab to learn more. We've got three different levels. We'd love to get your support to help promote a book, uh, your organization, perhaps even your ministry. Uh, If you'd like to partner with us, we'd love to have you. So again, you can go to veracityhill.com to learn more. Well, on today's episode, we're talking about cinematic faith. Uh, But before we continue, uh, we have a, uh, well, at least for me, one of the, the favorite segments of the program. Uh, and uh, it's it's called What's Behind Kurt? What's Behind Kurt is the name of the segment. That's Chris harmonizing three different versions, four different versions of his voice. <laughs> uh, so uh, the name of the game is What's Behind Kurt. This is a green screen behind me. And so, uh, but of course, what you're watching on Facebook and YouTube is not the green screen. Well, you're seeing a different image. Um, and so instead of the Veracity Hill banner, uh, listeners submit uh, questions. Sometimes Mark or Chris will come up with one themselves that they want to do. And I am proud to announce that I've got this, uh, I've succeeded two weeks in a row now uh, with this segment. And uh, two weeks ago, it was Jif Peanut Butter or GIF peanut butter, or, you know. Uh, and then last week was Dennis Rodman, the Chicago uh, Bulls uh, power forward uh, uh, in the 90s. And so I think Chris told me he's come up with this one this week. Uh, of course, if you want to submit your image, you can email chris at defendersmedia.com, give him an answer for, you know, what you're looking for, Tim the Toolman Taylor, uh, or uh, Tim Allen the actor, you know, depends on the photo, that sort of thing. And it is important to note that I am chris at defendersmedia.com, but that is also my email, chris at defendersmedia.com. What did I say? Well, you said that. You said it as email chris yes. at defenders.com. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, oh, so right, it could right. be, I just want to consider that, yeah, that he's in fact is giving you my email. <laughs> chris at defendersmedia.com, yes. Right. Okay, so uh, here are the rules. Uh, as many of you uh, longtime listeners now know, 15 questions. It's not 20 questions, 15. We started with 12 and it wasn't enough. We had to add a few more. 15, three minutes. I've got three minutes to do this in the interest of time. Uh, and so some weeks it, it gets close. Um, yes. Okay, so I will start the timer if you are ready, Chris. I'm ready. Okay. <clears throat> Is it a person? No. Is it a place? Yes. Ooh, fun. Okay, is it in the, uh, um, is it on our planet Earth? Yes. Okay, so it's a real place, not a fictional place like Hogwarts. 
Is that another question? Or it, it, is, is, it, it is. It is another question. It yeah. is a real place. Okay, yes. cool, cool. Hogwarts <coughs> real. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, is it in the Western Hemisphere? Yes. So like North America, Central South America. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Well, I'd say it's in. The Ooh, he's got area. he's got hesitation about well, that. I was just figuring out. What Maybe it's like the Arctic Circle, <laughs> and he's like, "Where?" Um, okay, is it in the Northern Hemisphere? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, how many questions is that? That's six. All right, I'm six just years. about a minute through. Okay. Is it in the United States of America? Yes. Okay. Is it in the contiguous 48 states, meaning not Alaska, not Hawaii? Oh, yes. Okay. Is it, I mean, I got to narrow this down faster. Is it east of the Mississippi River? Yes. Is it north of the Mason-Dixon line? <laughs> I don't know where the Mason-Dixon line is. Uh, it's K K Kentucky, uh, just imagine, uh, so I think southern border Kentucky, isn't that? Or? Yeah, I think it is north of the Mason-Dixon I would say it is. Yeah. Okay. All right, so you guys aren't exactly certain about that, so maybe like we've already ruled out as north of New York. Maybe it's like what? Final five, final five. I only got five questions yeah. left. Oh, man. Is it in Washington, D.C.? Uh, No. No, wait, Man, what, that wouldn't that be a question? That was the that question. Was, that was a question. Yeah, but yeah. the city would be Washington. DC. Well, it no, could, no, no, it could it be could like be... the Washington Monument. It could be a specific yeah, I'm not saying place. A, yeah, yeah. It Lincoln's it Memorial. Oh, that, sort of thing. that is true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, man, so that was a wasted question because I wasn't able to narrow it. Oh, boy. Is it in a state connected to a great lake? Yes. What? It is? Yes. How many, I've got like three left. Uh, yes. Did you, you did you pick like a random town? This is not a, an official question. Did you pick a random town in Michigan or something? I mean, that's. Uh, no. This is this is something. I can't tell you. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. Um. Oh man, I've got fourteen seconds. Um. Is it in Michigan? No. Is it in Indiana? No. Is it in Illinois? No. Was your, that was all. <laughs> I, I mean, I, through them all. I don't have enough questions. I didn't think well, all right, that was what is connected the, to a great name. It may not be. I think I've heard it is. I couldn't find any information. Okay, I'm, I'm opening is. the uh, iPad so I can see what it is since I've lost oh, no, okay. today's program. So keep keep it up here. I thought this would okay. be um, easy. I'm sorry. Oh, well, man, it, is, it's hard. It's hard because I had to narrow oh, it, it down. Hard. You had to narrow them down. Nice yep. striker. Nice yeah, okay. Well, good this questions. is... Good nice striker. Okay. What city is that? That, I, like maybe not seeing all of it. Is that Detroit? No, it's not. That is that is New York City. Wait. Oh. What? Dirty. It's state connected to the Great Lake. Upstate New York is that. Yeah, uh, that's Wait, Erie. Wait, what Great Lake it's is it? Oh, Lake Erie. Oh, it is. Oh. Man, okay. I was not thinking New York. Oh. You mentioned it. You once. did mention yeah. it. But I, I know. Think you mentioned I mentioned the New York state. City because nice, you guys nice were uncertain though. about the Mason Dixon line. Oh, well, uh, I lost. Don't we have, like, losing music or something? I don't have any losing music. I can, I can make some. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's that segment of What's Behind Kurt. I ran out of time and uh, uh, was just going in the wrong direction. Well done. Well done for stumping me. Again, if you want to submit a uh, an image behind me, email chris at defendersmedia.com. That's the email address. Um, it's a fun segment of the program. Okay. Well, Another fun segment of the program where we invite Bill uh, here is rapid questions. Bill, now I didn't tell you about this beforehand. Um, mm. These are, um, I think you'll do very well at this though. Um, these are just fun, goofy questions. Um, I would say totally unrelated to the subject matter, but some of the questions in fact are. Uh, some, uh, some of our guests are New Testament scholars or theologians or whatnot, so asking them what their favorite movie is, uh, you know, uh, is something totally different, but of course you you don't have a favorite movie, do you? Um, Not necessarily. There's right. a lot of good, really good ones I have on the list. Okay, so I'll you I'll maybe try to carefully. Yeah, yeah. I'll, well, we'll we'll see. I, I may try to avoid the movie questions then, um, because Aww. the idea is that you're able to answer these quickly, as many as you can. Um, okay. So if you're ready, I'll start the game clock and we'll get rolling. Okay. KFC or Taco Bell? Taco Bell. 
What's your clothing store of choice? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Eddie Bauer. Okay. Um, what is your number one phobia? Number one phobia. Um, the dark. <laughs> I don't know. What's What's your favorite pizza topping? Uh, just oh, mushroom and onion. Okay, good. Uh, do you have a favorite superhero? Not really, I guess. Batman's an interesting one, though. Sure. Okay, pick a fictional character that you would like to meet. Uh, a fictional character I would like to meet. <laughs> Billy Blaze Jowski. Billy Blaze Jowski. Okay, well, we've first, we've run out of time, so thank you for uh, playing that round of rapid questions. I have no idea who that is. Could you tell me? That was Michael Keaton's breakout role in a movie called Night Shift. Mark, have you seen that movie, Night Shift? I have not, no. Oh. But, any, but any fictional character by Michael Keaton has uh, got to be a good one. So He was, he was thinking Batman. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it was his breakout role. It's, it's, it's Henry Winkler's in it and uh, Michael Keaton. And I'm forgetting the name of the actress. She used to be on Cheers. She played Diane on Cheers. Oh, okay. Well, I think yeah. I think Mark's just found a movie that he's going to have to go and watch now. Uh, yeah, it's very funny. It's very funny. They sort of bring, um, uh, well, it's it, it's a funny movie in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get back to the subject matter here, talking about cinematic faith, the way that Christians um, can or even should be uh, viewing art uh, as uh, view, viewing film as a form of art and that uh, I know we've sort of already discussed in Hammered Home how so-called Christian films uh, fail to uh, demonstrate verisimilitude and on that standard uh, maybe that's a good standard people can think about hey does this film have verisimilitude of course when we're talking about superheroes I mean that's technically not you know, people flying in the sky. I mean, that's doesn't have verisimilitude, but it's like believable enough, right? Uh, the script writing is good. Uh, it's it's good uh, camera work, sound, all that stuff. It, it helps make it believable. So the one thing that we're supposed to suspend judgment on is what sort of gives us the enjoyment. Oh, you know, the person that flies in the sky. Um, so there is that aspect. Uh, let me ask you about... Um, about American action and adventure movies. Um, what is it that Christians can sort of learn? Aren't these just sort of traditional, um, you know, the good guy has something he's got to overcome and to, to defeat the bad guy, and and we expect the bad guy to lose in the end. What, what can Christians learn from those types of films? Well, I mean, a lot of, I mean, the, the triumph of good over evil is a theme we obviously support, you know, and that kind of thing. And um, action films are big in the cinema because the cinema is a lot about spectacle, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you get to see car chases and shoot them up kinds of things and big explosions and all that kind of stuff like that, people really go in for those sorts of things. <laughs> you know, that's, you know, I mean, I like it, action adventure films too. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, the, the first I really liked Raiders of the Lost Ark was just the Indiana Jones was a real interesting character to, to meet. And, and uh, they've done pretty well with that that series. And the uh, the Die Hard series, of course, sort of pioneered it. And they've been able to make hay with that one as well. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I like to watch action films, the uh, James Bond movies. You know, I mean, we like the intrigue of it all and the weaponry that people use and all that kind of stuff like that that's just a part of that you know i mean as long as michael bay is uh having huge explosions uh transformers movies will continue to be made <laughs> they will they will be made that's right that's right yeah. <laughs> as long as there's money to be made uh so at some point you know, consumers would have to just stop going to the theaters, right? If they get sort of annoyed or fed up or bored uh, with that same style, the same movies over and over. 
And so then um, people have to get creative to keep them coming uh, in those. Well, and that was some some of the, uh, you know, in 2014, they called it, uh, you know, the year of the Bible in Hollywood or something, phrase like that, you know, and when they made Noah, you know, they made very explicit statements that Noah was like a, a superhero, you know, in, in his particular time period. And that's the way they cast Russell Crowe in the, in the role and those sorts of things. And they just thought they wouldn't have to pay Marvel comics, you know, all the royalty fees for that stuff. Cause the Bible's, you know, in the uh, public domain, you know, yeah. didn't pan out so well, but it was kind of the idea behind it is they could, they could, these were the new superheroes mm. at, at the time. So one of the things I liked about that movie was the, um, realistic depiction of what it would be like if you were Noah and all of planet earth was just flooded. Um, I mean, we, we do these Sunday school little lessons for kids and everyone's happy on the ark. You know, the animals are smiling and you know, Noah and his family are smiling and, Oh, isn't this a nice thing? And it's like, well, wait a second. Let's really think about what's happened here. Let's give, let's give some background to, why Noah ended up being drunk, uh, you know, and his sons discovered him. I mean, that's something the Sunday school stories really don't provide. And they sort of give this happy picture of the uh, very unfortunate, sad set of circumstances. So in that sense, Hollywood has, I think, helped bring a, a good corrective to um, churches and the way Christians are thinking about the biblical story. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, they kind of used a bit of middle earth in that one. And yes, yeah. and you're right. People, I mean, I, everybody, a lot of went to see, gee, wonder what it was like when it rained for 40 days and 40 nights and that, that sort of thing too. So, uh, so yeah, there's, there's something to that. Yeah. Mark's got a question for you, Bill. Yeah, I was just, uh, <laughs> Thinking, um, I was just wondering, because uh, I remember seeing for you, you were a big into film history and stuff. Um, we were talking about action movies, and I was thinking of uh, one of the first real ones, and it's actually not even an American one. It's uh, from Japan. It's uh, uh, Seven Samurai. Yeah. Uh, Akira Kur- Kurosawa. Kurosawa. Um, yeah. Uh, great movie, too. So there's a lot of obvious times where action movies will you know, take from the past, and movies in general will do that. So, you know, like, Seven Samurai was taken off of when they made The Magnificent Seven, and there were other ish- other movies off of that, even A Bug's Life, the Disney Pixar movie, basically take took off of that, you know, bringing mm-hmm. people in to help train everyone and stuff like that. Do you think that, because I'm a huge movie person of the past too do you think christians can like still get more from movies of the past with the same type of elements that are still shown in today's movie i'm trying to fit word this question out i'm sorry um do do older movies um uh can they in some ways uh and correct me if i'm wrong mark but you're trying to ask can can they do a better job than some contemporary movies? Yeah. At- or at least does just a good a job, too, yeah. for that matter. Well, yeah, and I um, sure they can. I mean, I show I teach film history. Yeah. Um, and um, if you watch John Ford's film The Searchers, for example, I love that movie. Love that movie. Stars John Wayne. Yeah. Um, there's a film, 1956, um, that. Uh, plays with the conventions of the Western uh, uh, and and really makes uh, Ethan, the central character, is not not nearly as uh, heroic, at least through most of the movie. He has a very suspicious past that we wonder about and all. And, and that, of course, then in the end, he does the right thing. But in the meantime, he's he's brutally racist all throughout the film uh, and and sort of uh, parallel with him is the uh, uh, is is scar and so um, but that film people would say in context was really about racism in in the 1950s between uh, whites and African Americans like you know so the western has always been a genre 
because it's it's quite American with the frontier and gunslingers and this sort of thing, where you're able to talk about different kinds of issues. So when you think about Dustin Hoffman and Little Big Man in 1970, that was typically seen as a film about the Vietnam War. And he ends up being on both sides of the the frontier line. You know, sometimes he's, uh, you know, with the uh, uh, Native Americans and sometimes he's with the cavalry and that sort of thing back and forth between them. You know, and and uh, um, so that genres like that have that kind of capacity, I think, to help us understand a particular period of time. And it raises the question, why is it that Americans like films that always end up so violent, you know, with violence mm. in, in them? Um, that's that's the question to be thought about when we all talk about following the Prince of Peace, right? Mm. So yeah, right. Good, good. Other questions are raised. So, sort of a maybe a good segue here then is um, the Yellow Brick Road to self realization. How um, movies can help us better understand ourselves. Uh, talk talk more about that. Yeah, that's a classic trope in Hollywood films. Uh, you know, we, we mentioned Groundhog Day, for instance, yep. you know, and the one in with uh, I, I use that the yellow brick road example because it's such a clear one that Dorothy, uh, the tin tin man, the scarecrow and the cowardly lion all discover that that they already had within themselves everything that they needed to secure their own destiny. They just didn't know it. And so that's that moment of self-realization they have at the end that they they actually had everything they needed. They didn't need the wizard who's kind of the God figure in it. So, yeah. so I use that to get at it. So every, most American heroes have that kind of moment. Rocky Balboa has that moment where he discovers his, what he really can do and mm. become as a person, that, that moment of self-realization. And it's, um, it's kind of classic, you know, in, 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 in American films. Yeah. And so with, um, when Americans, like you'd mentioned with the violence, you know, especially for Christians, you know, we, we ask ourselves, hey, why are we enjoying this so much? Like, um, you know, if, if we are following the Prince of Peace, should we be indulging ourselves uh, in this type of entertainment? And, uh, of course, maybe Christians don't struggle with this as much, but that um, non-Christians may indulge in, like, sex scenes, for example, and that, hey, this is art. Well, I, I mean... I haven't seen the show, but I've heard about Game of Thrones just being really raunchy. Yeah. And and at some point you're like, no, this is this isn't art anymore. This is just, you know, trying to get people to watch the show because of what they're seeing on the screen. You know. Um, now now maybe there can be uh, Mark like yourself, someone who is analyzing the show. Uh, with a structured perspective. For the record, I've never seen it either. Okay, at any rate, but then, but that's sort of different than just indulging and letting it, you know, affect you uh, without sort of a critical uh, glass um, um, through which you're analyzing it. So, but that's sort of the thing where maybe art has a way of speaking to us and teaching us and helping us realize um, more about ourselves. Uh, and how we uh, are in culture, um, and maybe we need to take a step back. At the very least, we need to take a step back and think about these things, uh, and and to to give that, um, you know, whether or not we should continue to do those things uh, or act that way. Uh, and so, art has a way of doing that. Um, yeah. That now, I I've, I haven't seen Game of Thrones either. Okay, uh, but. But even we're talking about the action adventure film and stuff, and I've already said I enjoy those movies too, uh, and for for what they are, you know, and what they're, they're supposed to be, and, and and that kind of thing. And you meet very heroic people who act heroically <laughs> for yeah. different reasons and all. Um, uh, so, and they're very much a part of American culture, very much a part of, of American culture. Um, I find movies like that, though. And again, I, I don't know if you saw Tarantino's last film, this. Um, mm -hmm. Once, Once Upon, upon a, time a Time in Hollywood. Hollywood. Yes, I have. Yeah. I, I did see it. Yeah. Oh, you did see it? OK, so I, I like that film very much. Um, and um, I don't always like Tarantino films. I like some of them, but but not all of them. But but um, in that film, uh, he sort of rewrites a bit, you know, the end of the 1960s and, uh, uh, you know, 
turns the story in terms of the Manson murders and that kind of thing. But when it got to that final scene, you know, where, you know, there's the, the big bloodbath and that sort of stuff like that. In my mind, that was so over the top. But that's, that it was, <laughs> that's it was Tarantino. <laughs> laugh out loud funny in some ways. You yeah. Know, that, that it occurred the way that it did occur. Right. Under all the circumstances they put together. And then they had that one moment where Leonardo DiCaprio's character is in the pool and he runs into the bathhouse. And you had to think now. Why? Why would he run into the battle? And when he came out with that flamethrower, <laughs> you had to say to yourself, "I should have known that was coming." You know that 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 was. They just set you up. It's one of those things. Oh, I should have thought of that kind of stuff. You know. So you know that that violent. It was violent. You know, but it was it was over the top. You know, and and he has a way of doing that in such a way that you you're laughing. And then of course maybe later on you think, yeah, I don't know if I should have been laughing at that, but right. You know. It's a movie after all, I guess, and that sort of thing. So I know we're running short on time. I have to bring this up, though. You you mentioned um, one good aspect is that you've got a hero. You've got someone who's acting heroically. You have a an archetype hero, someone um, who maybe has a little bit of struggle. You don't want the, um, the Mary Sue type, uh, someone who's just perfect <laughs> in every way. Um, so I think here's Star Wars Luke Skywalker. He's the archetype. A hero. He's got some struggles, of course, but he's every boy's childhood hero. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we, we've had this raging debate over the Star Wars saga and uh, whether The Last Jedi was a good film because it, I mean, I argued it retconned Luke's character. Chris vehemently disagrees with me on that. Um uh, and uh, and then we'll, we also have different opinions on uh, Rise of Skywalker. So I'm sure Mark and Chris want me to ask you. So what did you think of those movies? What did you think of the the heroes? What they did with Skywalker changing? Well, maybe not changing his back, but it takes like there's no more archetypal hero anymore because he becomes this bitter, depressed guy. And that happens in life. Yeah, yeah but it takes away yeah. it takes away from the hero for me. Yeah. Well, it is, it's kind of sort of part of the trend too. Like even James Bond movies, the most a good for a while there, you know, it was all about, uh, he would have former, uh, spies that would, you know, leave and then be disillusioned and talk to him about it. And, and he even was kind of just uncertain about what he was doing and things like that. So, and they do it with Batman all the time. Mm. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, they're they're playing that with superheroes, too, is, uh, you know, the questions about what they do and their use of violence and, uh, and that kind of stuff. So that makes it more interesting. In the end, they always blow up the bad guy. You know, there's something to that. So uh, so those kinds of films, I can watch them. They're they're fun to see in that. But uh, there are other movies, I think, that I I enjoyed a little bit more in terms of making me think about the issues issues of life i'm i'm dealing with at the moment too you know sure so. yeah 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 all of us every one of us says we have things we're uh struggling with thinking about um you know whether it's a relationship issue or interpersonal issue and art has a way of speaking to us uh, i can think of um uh, when i was in high school the film collateral with tom cruise and, and jamie fox um because Jamie Foxx had these career aspirations for the, you know, creating a limo company. He was a taxi driver in the film. And so he wanted a, you know, better situation. And there was Tom Cruise and they're talking. Tom Cruise was an assassin. And, um, and they yeah. just had these discussions about what it meant to live life. Like, what does it matter? You know, dead guy on a train, nobody notices. And it's like, man, there's a lot that speaks there about life. Um, and I don't think that had any sort of, Christian undertones, but yet I found some meaning and value in that about what it means to be a human and, and what that means for perspective on human life. Uh, so I, sh I shared that experience and thought with the director or the scriptwriter or the actors. Um, so there's that shared experience with thinking about human life. Um, well, then what you said there, you hit a key point is that Christians are humans. Yeah. And we have all these same kinds of experience and they get represented in films in a lot of ways. I mean, think about that opening montage in that Pixar film. I think it's Pixar. Up. Oh, right? Up. Yeah. 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 The, the married you life know, scene. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh. Yeah, in five minutes, you know, oh my goodness with that covers, you know, and it's beautifully done. Yep. There's no words spoken in it. It's all imagery with the sound bridge and uh, the use of patterns that just by the time that thing is done, you're, you're crying really feeling for that <laughs> animated character. Right. Yep. You know, uh, because that's the stuff of life that people people fall in love. They put they live their lives together and then there's loss and they have to contend with that. And yeah, yeah, it's just remarkable. You know, it is beautiful. I mean, that's that's what it is. You know, that's that's beauty. Uh, mm -hmm. that, was, that was great art. Um, and then other messages in the up movie as well. I just love that, you know, Oh, it's just, it's just a house. You know, sometimes people become attached to objects. It's just a house. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, great film. Yeah. Good. Bill, thank you so much for joining us for our discussion today. Um, I want to encourage, uh, listeners and viewers, check this book out, uh, go purchase it. Cinematic faith, a Christian perspective on movies and meaning, uh, so many other movies that in, in here that we didn't even talk about today, but great uh, to learn about themes and motifs um, and the way that Christians should be analyzing film and what makes film good uh, and what we can learn from it, even from non-Christian directors and script writers. Uh, so much good material here. We're going to put a link uh, at our website so people can uh, purchase it. Uh, Bill, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun for me and I'm sure for these guys as well. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. God bless you. Well, that does it for the program today. I'm grateful for the continued support uh, that we have from our uh, patrons. Those are folks that just chip in a few bucks each month to keep us going and growing. Also, uh, thankful for the partnerships that we have with our sponsors. And they are Defenders Media, Consult Kevin, The Sky Floor, Rethinking Hell, the Illinois Family Institute, and Fox Restoration. I want to thank our technical producer, Chris, for all the fine work that he does. For Mark, our communications associate, I'm glad that we could uh, talk about film. That's really up his alley, his wheelhouse. I want to thank our guest, uh, Bill Romanowski, for the uh, fine discussion today uh, for us to learn more about what it means to be a Christian and uh, how we should view art in light of our Christian worldview uh, specifically. But last and certainly not least, I want to thank you for listening in and for striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. You've been listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. This is a listener-supported program. For more resources, including past shows, visit veracityhill.com.